Kanchan is the head of BPEA Credit Group. And uh, her career has traveled three decades in at least three countries, if I uh, <laughs> if, you know, understood this correctly, from India to Hong Kong to London, and now back in India, um, yeah. sporadically at least, yeah. right? Yeah. She's also an engineer and an MBA, my gosh. And last week when we were talking about this event and this interview and this conversation, uh, and we were talking about her career choices, and she said something to me that I found intriguing that I want to probe a little bit deeper this evening. She said, I was always more credit than equity. <laughs> okay. So you're going to have to demystify that for me, Kanchan. What does that mean to be more credit than equity? Um, you know, I started with ICICI. Right, when I started. And I think um, it sort of appealed to me, the work that I was doing. It was very interesting. And while um, you know, all of that sounded really good, what I think attracted me was debt capital markets in Asia, which at that time, this is in the 90s, were again expanding, doing a lot of work, you know, was the happening sort of place to be. And I took that opportunity and you know, took up a position in Hong Kong. I think fundamentally, for me, I've always felt um, you know, the debt as an asset class thinks a lot about risks where, where you are in the attachment point. You know, there's a whole range, and I always say you can do debt at 5% and you can do debt at 20%, right? So there's an entire range of where you want to be on that risk profile and a range of risks that you take, you underwrite, you want to get paid for. Uh, and I think that complexity, you know, I've always enjoyed a lot more. And I think just early on, I felt, you know, I want to do more debt. Like, I, I enjoy the structuring, I enjoy this risk analysis. Uh, and I think it was just that, that maybe I didn't get exposed to equity, get, got exposed to debt, so debt a lot more. more geeky. Yeah, it was just, it was, okay. I think it was my DNA. Okay, so you, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're the queen of private credit. Now, I want to take just 30 seconds in our limited time here to talk about what is private credit, because yeah. I think everyone has this slightly fuzzy idea of what it is, but no one's really quite sure, right? Yeah. The best and the simplest way I can define it is non-bank, non-public market credit, right? So you guys give loans to a variety yeah. of businesses of different kinds for different needs at different interest rates. Yeah. So what separates you from the banks? Why do companies come to you? Uh, because, you know, I mean, some of the, the coupons or the interest rates that I see uh, the private credit industry working at yeah. sound incredibly high to me. So. so, you know, I think, I mean, we need to maybe go back in history a little bit here, right? In the sense that if you see how the asset class evolved, this was in the US, uh, an economy that grows at low single digits, adequate, ample credit, probably, you know, more credit than you need. Banks are sophisticated, and yet you, you saw a situation where banks were withdrawing from certain end uses, really adapting to newer KYC norms, newer risk norms, you know, vacating a lot of the spaces. And private credit was essentially private capital that sort of went in and took that place. And I think it came largely from saying banks essentially intermediate depositor money, right? And you have, you have to have more complex risk norms as banks became larger the entire lending model had to shift to become more vanilla wholesale lending model. You have central risk policy, right? And you need to have homogeneous loan pools by which you can get a predictable risk premium and make that a profitable business. And I think that took the entire area of doing more customized loan capital for a variety of end users. It may be for growth, it may be for m &A, it may be for special sets, it may be into a distressed workout. I think all of that sort of came under the purview of private credit. Okay. For the simple reason that a private credit investor is not thinking necessarily about regulatory capital, right? A lot of the investment decision is based just on risk. Whereas banks, for the sake of making sure that our systemic risk is sort of adequately controlled and you're not losing depositor money, has to stick to doing regulatory capital norms, uh, you know, sector diversifications, looking at their own sector portfolio. So I think it's just not having those restrictions that okay. allows private credit to be more customized. Okay. So at BPA, I think you're do, you do more mid-market private credit. Uh, some of the industries you're invested in, or rather you've loaned money to our engineering, construction, financial services. You spoke of the US. I think that's an estimated $1.5 trillion yeah. private credit market. In India, we're still very, very small, very nascent stage. What do you think is the size of the addressable market in India? You know, the size of India at some stage should be the same as the US, right? But I think more than the size is, is just looking at what the nuance is, right? So for instance, and I think it's important to see India for what it is. In the US, it was withdrawal of banks, 
Hmm. And in the last spurt that you've seen now, it's the risks around the SVB event, right? And banks becoming sort of more sort of risk off. And that's what's driven that industry. I think in India, the, the nuances are different. We actually have a pretty stable, and I think one of the better banking systems that is there right now, right? I think all well, the you're work- you're saying that today, five, seven years ago? Yes, but all the work that got done- a very different story, right? Yeah, yeah, all the work that got done, you know, has put it in a good place, right? But we are also a three and a half trillion dollar economy that needs significant amount of capital to grow. Um, and I think for us, private credit, therefore, it's not about growing at the expense of bank. I think in India, private credit will grow alongside bank. It just fills a certain gap that is there in the, you know, in the capital model today. But why should a company come to you? I think if you look at the companies that are uh, in our portfolio, they all have bank lines. Are they all distressed companies? That, None that of them are, are distressed to, companies. That are unlikely to get bank credit they, or NBFC credit. They are coming 100% of either, these, you know. Yeah, 100% of these percent. companies have working capital lines, have clean sort of bank and track records. And there are various reasons why they won't get the capital they need from banks. I'll give you two or three different reasons. It could be that the banks they're dealing with are overexposed to the sector they are in. So a few years back, we lent to a, a solo module manufacturing company. They couldn't get the money from their banks because this was power sector and the banks were at that time already reeling under exposure to power sector. Money required for acquisition. Money required when you have an order book that's three or four times your annual revenues. That quantum of capital, you know, banks would hesitate to say, I can give you X, but I can't meet your full requirement. So there are all these reasons where, you know, banks are not able to lend or meet those needs. For a lot of these companies, having non-dilutive capital to get to that next level of growth is extremely interesting. Okay. Right? We're looking, and I think that's the sort of, when we talk about mid-market, this term really comes from the U.S. Because in the U.S. You wouldn't use it here in India? You won't. Be, no, you can use it, but it's not the same. So a I million, looked at all the private credit deals, at least the big ones in the last, you know, year or two. Yeah. Um, and they are mid-market. And, you know, with the exception of a few, like the Shapuji Palanji one, which yeah. is a very large one, yeah. the sizes are also fairly small. So all 50 so, million, you know, even smaller than that, 75 yeah. million max. So I think that's where we need to sort of differentiate and look closely. I think dollar equivalent size of Indian business does absolutely no justice to the true market presence, right? So in the US, a $30 million EBITDA company is lower middle market, mm. right? You have a certain risk profile that you associate with that. Look at India, if you think of a $30 million EBITDA company, right, that's like 250 crores of EBITDA. It's by no means a small company, right? It is most likely a market leader in whichever product or geography it operates in. So fundamentally at that size, if you think of Barring the large conglomerates which are billion dollar plus and which have 100 million dollar plus EBITDA, most market leading companies in most sectors will be in the 200 to 300, 400 million dollar range with yeah. those kinds of EBITDAs, right? And deal sizes typically would be a turn or two turns of EBITDA. So I think when we think, and one of the things that I tell a lot of LPs is I said, when you think of a three and a half trillion dollar economy in India, you use a PPP multiplier right, to get a sense of the volume of economic activity that's happening because of the absolute prices that are prevalent in the country. I said, when you think of a $200 million company in terms of its market presence, the kind of market share it has, it behaves probably a lot like a $500 million company in the US. And I think appreciating that's important because what we are lending to here are essentially market leading companies where the, in, and to your answer, why are they paying that high return? The incremental ROC for these businesses is so interesting that they would pay that higher cost, get that debt, get to that next level of growth without diluting the okay. equity. I want to talk about the risk that accompanies that. But before that, a very quick question on how do you see private credit growing in India? I mean, new spaces that even you all might want to cater to. Yep. Can you talk me through that? And, you know, your own funding, where you raise money from, are you saying, I think the last one was mostly domestic? No. So I, in terms of, I think, where we see last growing... One, just the last raise that you did. The last raise we did, we raised about $600 million of capital loans, about 70% offshore. 70% offshore. So when, does you, when do you start seeing domestic pools of capital coming? So we are amongst the few managers who've always raised money from onshore as well. And okay. one of the key, um, you know, beliefs we have is you have to be able to tell the story domestically, raise money from domestic investors who can see it a lot more closely while you also develop the offshore sources. I think already as an asset class, a number of 
high net worth individuals, sophisticated family offices have completely understood what is the value proposition of a private credit uh, investment. And I think what we talk about when we talk about private credit is an illiquidity premium, the extra alpha you generate hmm. for that risk. Uh, because you're providing a customized solution for a business that would not get it elsewhere. So you're hopeful that maybe round five, six, seven, will be maybe 70% domestic? It should be. It, it should be. It absolutely should be. I think there is a huge demand right now in the market for a 14, 15% INR fixed income product, right? Which is, which probably sits somewhere in between credit and fixed income. That return profile doesn't work for offshore investors because by the time they've accounted for FX and tax, it doesn't give them the relative value. Right. But I think it's a phenomenal product for India. Okay. And in, in terms of, you know, the kind of businesses that private credit will cater to, I see mostly it's real estate, uh, construction, you know, the businesses that need a lot of cash liquidity. Um, when does this move to manufacturing, consumer goods, things like that? Or those are not industries that, you know, would be able to afford or make viable the kind of interest rates that, or coupon rates that you... Uh, it's actually a completely sector agnostic approach. So even on our portfolio, you know, we talk about construction and engineering, but if you look at what the underlying is, a lot of these are EPC companies hmm. that are then servicing a number of very diverse end users. You know, you could be doing Ports, you could be doing roads business, you could be doing pipelines, you could be doing residential real estate. There are manufacturing companies as well who are seeing that kind of growth and we are seeing very real examples of companies benefiting from supply chain diversification away from China and seeing that volume of growth that needs to be funded via a private credit solution. Another very interesting opportunity is services sector. Right? We are 55% in, in terms of where we are on our GDP. I think services as a percentage of bank credit is about 25%. And that also depends on whether you include financial services or not. Services sector always struggles to get the kind of funding from banks because there is no hard assets. Yeah. They may have very sticky cash flows. They have great contracts, you know, that give them two, three year visibility over their revenues and earnings. They will struggle to get bank funding. And that's a huge area of expansion for private credit. So I, I don't think it's necessarily real estate. A lot of non-bank lending historically started with real estate because mm. banks were always uh, restricted from lending beyond right. a certain amount. But I think today you have the entire sector and that's actually what makes it really interesting for investors because you're accessing the growth that's available across sectors. You're doing it in a more moderate leverage. You're doing it in a downside controlled fashion and you're actually earning these returns and these premiums only because the underlying business are growing faster. How much of your lending is collateralized? Everything. All of it? 100%. Seriously, so that almost sounds like bank lending. So that's the, that's the beauty of why these loans are interesting in India. In the US, it's whole core loans, five to six times levered, because that's, you know, that's just how the sort of industry is. In India, our loans look and feel like bank loans, but generate these returns because it's massively but underpenetrated. But you don't have low-cost deposits like banks, and you don't have... So we're generating the returns, right? So right. you can imagine the kind of extra return that you're generating for investors. And you don't have a regulator. SEBI regulates us. Yes, but not the not in in any ways as closely as RBI so regulates I think banks it, or even now NBFCs. Correct. So I want to talk about risk. Yeah. Because you spoke of SVB uh, and we, you know, yeah. and I think we, we're, the conversation in the U.S. is already about you know yields at five percent and more. Uh, what happens to banks? What happens to all the bond portfolios sitting on their books? I'm curious to know how you're looking at both the macro and the micro risks, because the micro risks in India are not having enough information about borrowers. Uh, you know, we haven't built our information systems to the extent that you could, you know, any mid-market company. Uh, I, know, I know the credit score system and all of that yeah. has improved considerably over the last decade. But yet that still is, you know, large areas of gray. So how do you deal with this? So let me address the micro first. Actually, you would be surprised, you know, when we're looking at these companies, all of these companies have about 20, 25 years of track record, right? Uh, there is enough information in the public domain through their banking records, through what they file with, uh, you know, the, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs on the ROC for a credit manager to go in and do that kind of a due diligence. So it's not that much of a black box. I personally feel when you look at a lot of large corporates and a lot of complex balance sheets, I think you often have less transparency than when you look at a single business, a single balance sheet. You have information if you want going back as many years as you want for your analysis. So it's not that much of a black box. I think it's about learning and figuring out and having a specialized underwriting philosophy for looking at these companies, which is I think partly what we've developed over the years as we've built this business. 
um, it's not that much of a black Macro box. Risk. Yeah. Sorry? Macro risk. Macro risk for us. And that's interesting. I think, um, you know, pre-COVID, we were already looking at five, six quarters of sustained slowdown. I remember we were thinking, once we pass this normalization, big growth, you know, you know numbers that we are seeing, are we going to go back to where we were, right? Um, I think what we are seeing on the ground and just what we understand, because we spend a lot of time understanding this macro, I think the situation is different. Um, if you see where we were in 2019, there were a whole lot of big bank reforms that had come in, right? Was it GST or the banking sector reform? And I think we were still sort of reeling from that in some way. I think we feel that the COVID period has sort of, is when these reforms have run their full course and we are in a much better state now. I think corporate sector balance sheets are deleveraged far better. Banking sector, I think, is definitely healthy. We are back to seeing double digit you know, credit growth rate, which is absolutely essential. Um, and I think you have very real trends. I mean, the number five of years ago, Five years ago, you know, would private credit have worked in this country? Five years ago, when our banks were loaded with NPAs. Five years ago, when we didn't have all these information systems. Are you saying it's a, it's a sort of a, you know, a, a function of timing, that we've been able to get through all of that, and today, therefore, you know, the space is prime and ready for something like private credit? It is, because I think, you know, I mean, just look at the entire asset class in the US. It's 15 years old. But cycles will come and go. So what happens five years from now? So, in fact, this as a sector, that, that's the point here, that this industry has not become relevant or has become interesting because banks were going through their reform, hmm. right? The whole point is about a significant shortage in capital. And you need an additional source of capital. I think this is a way for us. Why this is relevant, it's a way for us to tap into a completely different source of capital, whether it's pension fund money, endowment money, insurance money, because they're looking at a different risk and return profile. And it's a way of plugging, you know, the hole we have in terms of, you know, our capital needs as an economy. Okay. I have one final question on this before I do, uh, you know, a wrap question, worst decision. So think about it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I do want to know about the contagion effect of, let's say, a collapse in the private sec private credit industry. Um, I'm not sure whether to situate that hypothetically in India or in the U.S. Uh, because it's just so much more mature in the U.S. that it might, you know, work to talk about that. But these are pools of capital that seem unrelated, unconnected, but probably are. Um, you know, how, what should one expect? If there is a big macro risk that were to play out, you know, what is the kind of systemic issue we're looking at here? Because it's a less regulated industry everywhere in the world. You don't have capital requirements like banks do or non-banking finance companies do. So I'm just concerned about how this would play out. I think in India, we are still very small. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, so I think we are not I at the stage. I have a number to it. I think some 8 billion, 4 billion yeah. in the first half. It's of something like that. It's very small. Like you yeah. know, a lot of times I tell investors, you know, you've seen how it has evolved in the U.S. Yeah, if you could go back. But small can have a deep contagion effect. It we saw have. that with debt mutual funds not very long ago, you know. We saw that with ILNFS not very long ago in India. So. Correct. Yeah. So I think firstly, just in terms of system, because it's very small. Right. It, it is not at a level in terms of the okay, size of the industry. Okay, suppose we were not industry. 8, 10 billion and we were 50 Yes, billion. we were, what if we were 200 billion, yeah. then yes. So you, you expect more regulation to come in? Do you expect, you know, someone um, to stand up and say, hey, you know, someone I don't think so, so because I think because. it's also about understanding where the industry is right now, because what would we regulate? Right, if, somebody, if you come in now, what are we going to regulate? Are we going to tell managers what they can invest in or not? I think the important thing that we have to recognize is private credit is getting done through AIFs. Yeah. Our minimum ticket size is a crore plus. Our, if you look at our average ticket size, it's sort of four, five, six crores. You're tapping into a very different investor segment. I think SEBI as a regulator has already come in and you know, created a lot of reporting requirements. You know, the PPMs have to actually show your full waterfall, right? I think all of that is, is a right move. Um, but fundamentally, there is no leverage in these products. Right? It's not as if we've taken 100 not yet million of this. Yeah, not, not yet. yet not yet. And banks are not allowed to, to, to lend to these AIFs. So you don't have that. So you don't have 100 million of equity that's got levered with 400 million of leverage. I think that creates a different level of risk. Okay. These are unlevered products. So I don't think we are at a place where you're saying, oh, there's big contagion risk. In, you so know, you're indicating just this. a one way upward path right now uh, of growth, growth, and more growth for private credit. I think in, in absolute terms, yes. yes. But like with every asset class, you always have the risks of excesses. I feel 
too much, too soon is a problem because there will be credit decisions that will be wrong, that will take investors away from the asset class. I think 10 years back, I used to say that if there are five $1 billion funds in India, you know, it's a problem. Because it's not just about the size of the opportunity. Do you have enough people who can work on that opportunity? Resources, lawyers, um, trustees, right? You need a whole ecosystem, ecosystem to develop. So we can say that, yes, this can be a $300 billion asset class in India as well, let's say over the next 15 years. Will it happen over the next 15 years? Unlikely. But will the 10 go to 30, 40, 50? Yeah. How soon? Possibly. How soon? Over the next 15 years? Yeah. 15 Quite years? Possibly. So how, what will it be next year, the, you know, two years down the line? I think you look at the new I mean, you, you have a sense of the easily, fundraising that's happening already so in the market that we double. don't know of. So. It can easily double year So we'll be year. at 20 billion next year if we were talking to you at the same time next year? In a couple of years, yeah. A couple of years, yes? Yeah. Okay. Worst decision in your professional Ooh. I'm going to sound like Radhika wasn't here. So many things she said, I was thinking like, oh, I'm hearing myself. She said she had um, never made a bad decision in her life. You know, I think I, I understand that because I feel the same. I think every time you make a decision, you make it based on whatever information you have, whatever amount of courage you have, right? And sometimes whatever degrees of freedom you have. So, it, yeah, sometimes those decisions don't turn out the way you think they will. But I do think they just, you know, leave you with very good lessons. I don't have... I, I have a bad decision I almost made. So if I have to share that with you. This was when I was in London working with Barclays. Um, I just had my, uh, my uh, second child, you know, my son. And, you know, I think the first 10 years, all of us have gone through, I want to work and I want to do everything and am I doing justice to my little kids at home? You know, we struggled with that. We struggled with guilt forever. And, I, and we'd just gone through a big upheaval in the bank. There was a big change in leadership. And I sort of came back and said, man, I'm not going to be able to do this. I need to, this was in Barclays, right? And I said, I prepared my whole spiel. I was going to have um, performance appraisal on, my, on the phone because I was in maternity leave and I decided I'm going to say, I want to do a middle office role. I want to take a back seat and I prepared all of that. And I got on the call with my, with our CEO, with our new boss. And he said, okay, before we get into the details, I just want to share something with you. And I'm like, okay. And he says, actually, we've decided, I think that, you know, we'd like to promote you to director. And he says, you know, I've spent six months with you. I know we're all new here, but we're really happy with the work you've done. And I had my whole thing written. I was just like, put it away. <laughs> I was like, I'm not having this discussion right now. Uh, but that would have been a bad decision because it wasn't coming from my heart. It was just, you know, sometimes the fear of not being able to manage and the fact that the overall, you know, environment had changed and all new people had come in. Yeah. Well, we're glad you persisted and thank you for being with us here this evening, Kanchan. Thank you. It was you. a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.